and pick it up from the Daily Trust newspaper. Bread, one of the cheapest commodities that despite the gap or margin between the rich, the middle class, which is reportedly non-existent in Nigeria anymore, and the poor, at least every family, is supposed to be able to afford a loaf of bread. Now, Dr. Laz, with the story reported by the Daily Trust newspaper this morning, is the concern of bakeries, which are reportedly closing shop due to a rising cost of production. This means that uh, some workers would need to be laid off. And whilst the price is high, most families might not be able to make ends meet or even provide what is now known as the proverbial daily bread. Let's get your thoughts on this. Yes, um, bread, uh, like you rightly noted, is a commodity that almost everyone uh, wants to have across all ages, and particularly children. Uh, most common breakfast they usually have before going to school. So it, it's just a reflection of the inflation uh, that has occurred. And for some of these commodities that are in high demands, it appears to be worse hit. So uh, something seriously has to be done. Uh, I recall that if you compare the price of a loaf of bread in Abuja, say, two years ago, and what it is now, it's probably four times, you know, uh, four times increase. So as at 2022, early in 2022, you could still get uh, some of the basic sliced bread between 400 and 500. Right now, it's around one seven to 2,000, depending on uh, the type of bread you want to have. So it's, it's just kind of, you know, bread is just one of those things. There is overall inflation, food inflation that is over 40%, you know, so, and bread is not excluded, affordable at the least. Whatever now, that let's try and form a correlation with this free import duty window that's supposed to span a period of 150 days. We hear amongst the commodities and grains to be imported is wheat. And now, as we look at flour as one of the key components for the manufacturing of bread, uh, let's look at some of the infographics with comments coming in from, on the one hand, the Senate president, which is who is talking about fertilizers being disbursed to states to spur productivity, whilst the minister of agriculture this morning is also pictured talking about how dedicated the federal government is uh, in terms of uh, making this come true. Now, let's begin with that of the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, the Premium Times has captured his statement with the catchphrase, duty-free importation. The government has suspended duty tariffs and taxes for the importation of certain food commodities through land and sea borders. These commodities include maize, hocks, brown rice, wheat, and cow peas. This is as quoted from Nigeria's Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Abubakar Kiari. Uh, doctor, let's look at some of those commodities as highlighted. Maize, husked, brown rice, wheat, like I mentioned earlier, and cow peas, in terms of the demand in the market, would this be substantial enough to bring down the prices as projected by the federal government in the next six months? Yes, uh, maybe it could uh, likely bring down the price on a short-term basis, but for for for, for it to be sustainable, there have to be local production. Nigeria has huge arable lands. You know, we should be able to produce what we can eat. We've been saying this <laughs> for, uh, I can't remember the number of years, you know, so that should be a priority. Why measures are taken to address, uh, you know, some of these challenges on a short-term basis, but long-term sustainability is very crucial. For how long are we going to depend on importation of this with or without duties? You know, so without the duties, yes, on a short term level, there could be some reprieve. But for how long do we sustain that? Well, the question is the timeline now, which is very pressing. And the Senate president also made mention that uh, states across the Federation had received 60 bags of fertilizer outside what is given to their senators who have. Uh, uh, certain duties that they owe their constituencies. Let's pick up his infographics and look at it in terms of what he is saying as it concerns the food crisis. Now, with the catchphrase food crisis is this publication on the Premium Times online platform. It says all states of the Federation are being provided 
with 60 trucks of fertilizers outside what is being given to the senators, says the president of the Senate, Senator Godswill Akbabio. Now, one of the reactions to this story was a comment by a certain farmer in the northwestern part of Nigeria who said that she had applied fertilizers she bought over 40 bags, but owing to the consistent rains, that all the fertilizers were washed away. Now, these are some of the challenges as government looks to provide soccer, some natural disasters. Uh, much cannot be blamed on the farmer, neither can it be blamed on the state in question. But in situations like this, uh, what do farmers do? Well, uh, rain is part of what is needed even for, for the farms to be productive, uh, for the crops to grow. So we can't wish that there should be no rains. Um, some of these things are some natural that we don't have absolute control over, but there are things we have control over. Yes, uh, fertilizers. Uh, we usually hear about the input aspect or oh, government is uh, making plans or is supplying these fertilizers. Uh, but uh, we also need to interrogate how many farmers are getting this and we need to track it to the other end. Okay, uh, if government approves uh, you know, a f certain number of fertilizers, how many of them reach the farmers? What proportion gets? We know the corruption in that system that not always all of them get to the real farmers. Sometimes you find them in the in the homes of uh, some political actors or even party officials uh, packed there perhaps for sale or for some other thing. So let it get to the farmers. We should be able to track that and let the farmers themselves uh, be able to confirm that, yes, we got these fertilizers uh, and it's, it's helpful. During the, uh, the harvest season, we should be able to see that these fertilizers have been able to increase the yield uh, from what it used to be to what it is now. So until we follow it up to that point, I'm not excited about this news because when you talk to farmers, uh, what their experience is is far different from what we hear in the news uh, regarding the level of support uh, that they get. Yes, some people do get that support, but many do not get it. Now, one of the things we all look to always talk about when we're discussing issues is the area of sustainability, you know, um, with um, the away from the main production comes the place of storage. We've um, harped on the fact that severally that it's as though we do not have enough storage system to uh, store some of this produce after the harvest has been done. Uh, away, aside um, the importation of goods and all that, how can we begin to look, what can we begin to do to look into storage, proper storage system, even for the imported goods, the ones that will be planted in the country, so that uh, when we have off-cycle periods, for instance, we would not uh, be faced with um, increments in food prices? Absolutely, that's a great point there. Uh, storage is very critical, and the, the entire value chain uh, for for production of uh, crops or agri produces from uh, planting to harvest to storage, they're moving it to uh, for, uh, you know to the market where people could have access to it. Uh, the, the 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 farmers and uh, you know should get support. There are these silos that we have a lot of agencies within the Ministry of Federal Ministry of Agriculture, and also every state has a Minister of Agriculture. Um, is uh, we, we get a lot of produce get to damage due to the poor storage system. And I think it's an area that, you know, the key stakeholders must be engaged to identify specifically uh, what needs to be done, uh, the support. A government may not primarily drive all of that. In some cases, yes, uh, they could. In some other cases, you could have these people in the sector get the support they need. It could be funding. It could be transportation, which is key, moving it from point A from to point B, you know, from the farm to where it's going to be stored. Uh, power situation uh, is also uh, a challenge in some cases in, in getting some of these things done and also control of pests. And, uh, you know, so, so many of these challenges, yes, uh, it's, it's quite crucial to, to get the storage facilities available. 
Now, in moving past the debates and discussions as it regards the strategy and frameworks of the government to crash down the price of food commodities, another pressing issue that garnered momentum yesterday in the wee hours was the Court of Justice ruling as it concerns the hashtag NSAS protest of 2020. Now, the Court of Justice of ECOWAS has found the federal government guilty as reported by three of the papers this morning as we looked at in our overview. Now, they, they ordered to pay 2 million naira's compensation to said victims of the NSAS protest. Now, and it's coming at a time when a lot of persons are debating on how social justice can be seen to be done in the Nigerian society. Uh, does this consolidate ECOWAS's rededication to democracy across the, the, the regional bloc? Yes, uh, that judgment uh, is, is kind of good because we, we know that the government of Nigeria has been in denial over its complicit uh, behavior during the NSARS uh, protest. It's quite unfortunate that uh, a government will kill its own people, young people in this case, who all they had in their hands were flags you know, are making demands for an end to police brutality and also uh, for good governance. And even after that, even with lots of evidence to, to show that, you know, there were loss of lives, there were additional brutality of people leading to loss of lives, uh, the, the government hasn't quite acknowledged that. So this judgment uh, is a, partially a consolation uh, for people, especially families who lost their loved ones, which uh, our government never acknowledged, you know, and I think with this judgment is is just good for the government, federal government of Nigeria, to own up to to its um, disappointing handling of the answers and apologize uh, to the Nigerian people, and of course uh, compensate the victims. It's, it's quite shameful that, you know, it's an ECOWAS court that uh, this has gone to uh, because we have courts in Nigeria. So uh, our court system should have been able to dis dispense uh, justice in this case. But it appeared that the, the whole system, you know, were kind of in that denial mode, failing to acknowledge the obvious. So it's a bit of consolation. I do hope the, the government, not apart from just acknowledging uh, this offense and apologizing to the Nigerian people, especially the Nigerian youth, uh, but also ensure that it doesn't, it never does that again, you know, using arms against citizens who are simply expressing their rights. And Doctor, moving forward, I just have two more points before uh, we also hear from Peace on her concerns as well. First off is on the quest to strengthen institutions. Now, the Nigerian Human Rights Commission uh, has some of its mandates in receiving complaints and helping uh, citizens prosecute such cases of violations of fundamental human rights. But any time the word protest comes up in the Nigerian perspective, there is some concern on the part of the government in terms of how the protest is seen to be done in provisions of the fundamental rights of Nigerians as enshrined in the 1999 constitution to protest certain grievances. Now, how do we get the NHRC working again and ensure that going forward, Nigerians can, if they choose to, express their rights in that direction without having to be met by brutal force? I think the, the, the NHR, National Human Rights Commission is, is doing what it could in handling as many cases that it, it can, uh, taking a position at crucial points. Uh, I recall uh, in the past, especially in the Gwari administration, where there was a kind of unwritten policy against uh, any form of protest, and people were hounded, uh, incarcerated, uh, the Shore case, and uh, some people even had to leave the country at some point. You know, the National Human Rights Commission has consistently taken a position on, on those issues. But it's, it's not just about uh, what the NHRC is able to do or not. It's for the political actors, the leaders at different levels, to accept this fact that, you know, no matter what you do, no matter how good you think you are, 
there are people who will disagree with you. And uh, to some extent, uh, they could vent their disagreements or their grievance in, in different ways. Uh, right to free speech, right to free expression, you know, is a, a fundamental human right guaranteed by the 1999 constitution as amended, as well as the various international treaties we signed up to. You know, so it appears that the leadership authorities, you know, resent people uh, expressing uh, views that they do not accept, which is, is not, this is a democracy, you know, and the key component of democracy is the ability of people to disagree. And there is absolutely no offense for people to uh, peacefully express their, their grievance. So uh, we need to come to, especially the security agents as well, that will be like, oh, who authorized this uh, gathering? No, people can gather and express themselves. If they notify the police or the security agents, it is for them to ensure that, you know, bad elements don't hijack it to cause trouble. But for any protest that gets violent in this country, most of them, you usually have state actors sponsoring that just to find an excuse uh, to disrupt that, uh, that uh, protest. So uh, I think it's, perhaps it's a hangover of colonialism, which got into many years of military uh, dictatorship that tend to criminalize uh, protests. And we see not only in government, even in the universities, where for students to gather to express themselves. You see vice chancellors shutting down school, proscribing students' union, and, and all of that is absolutely reprehensible. And I think we, we need to get better with that. All right, so I'm moving to, let's look at um, the main cause, for instance, of the NSAS protest. Uh, it brings us to the place of uh, brutality, as we see with um, some institutions, especially when it comes to um, anti-corruption agencies and, uh, you know, agencies that are supposed to protect the rights of Nigerians. Um, brutality has become something, and, uh, well, it's, it's worthy of me to uh, say that um, the Inspector General of Police, I'm talking about um, Lukaya Begbetoko, is doing what he could to, or what he can to uh, make sure that we do not see so much of brutality when it comes to police first and dealing with uh, um, Nigerian youth and or citizens of Nigeria. But um, recent recent times, I think a few weeks back, we saw the uh, um, somewhat unlawful reading of uh, a hotel by the EFCC and uh, other different pockets of uh, some kind of brutality or show of force by our uh, Nigerian military or anti-corrupt agents, corruption agencies and things like that. How do we begin to cut down on these things so that so bringing it to a place where Nigerians can trust the system and trust the process, you know, so that we can have a free and fair uh, uh, country? Yes, that, that's, that's a very important question, uh, whether we've made significant improvements from NSARS. Yeah, uh, NSARS was about protesting against police brutality, where especially young people who are in tech, where it's almost like an offense uh, to carry a laptop or an offense to dress well and have a good uh, uh, tablet or handset or phone. You know, so uh, have we made certain improvement I wouldn't know uh, because you need data uh, to, to be able to prove that. But I would say from what I read on social media, from even some personal experiences, uh, when you drive long distance, perhaps from Abuja to Moko, in Benue State, or to uh, Edo or some parts of the, especially in, in the southern part of the country, uh, you get lots of harassment uh, on the way get talked to by security, some security uh, officials, as if, as if you are a criminal, you know. Uh, the law says everybody is innocent until proven guilty, but a lot of times the engagement is as if you are guilty and you have to prove uh, yeah, your innocent. innocence. And I receive calls periodically from uh, young people who get harassed on, on the way and they'll just say, oh, you are a Yahoo boy, you are this, what do you do for... 
you know, get delayed, uh, commercial vehicles are stopped and people are asked to come out, their wallets search, despite many announcements and releases by the, the police authorities. So I think this uh, in, in every group, there will always be different, you know, no matter what these institutions do, some of them will still be unprofessional, but we just need to get this minimized. You know, we need to see that uh, the police authorities, good enough, they have police complaints units. Uh, we have some police PROs, the national PPRO is on uh, social media, active on X. Some states also have their PROs that are active on these communication channels. I think all the 36 states needs to have their police PROs uh, be accessible, you know, even though sometimes they use some languages that are condescending to citizens who disagree with them, but it's still a positive development that you have a platform that they could be assessed even when they don't, uh, they don't always agree. So that that's one. At the local level, people who are not on the internet, how do people make reports, uh, you know? So both at the community level, at the regional level, the police should be getting this feedback. And when they get those feedback, it should be investigated and actions taken. What we see is that mostly the ones that, that are caught on camera and put out there and uh, media stations report it, you know, those are the ones that usually like, and those ones usually perhaps involve influential people or, you know, public outrage, you get certain actions taken. But what about many that happen that are not caught on camera. Even in some cases, when you go to report, you are made a victim, you know, of, of what you don't know about. So this really has, many people have been traumatized severely from this, and it, it kind of spoils the effort of the good cops, because there are good cops have engaged a, a good number of police and security people who are quite professional in their job. And majority of them, I would say, are that professional. But those who stand on the roadside, who are minority when you compare to the overall population of the police or security agents, are the ones who engage with citizens in this manner, create that bad blood to the extent that, you know, the default mode of people is to get scared when they see people in police uniform, when they are supposed to feel safer. And that also applies to EFCC. Unfortunately, EFCC kind of have descended, you know, we don't, we don't used to know EFCC to be operating the way it's, it has been shown to operate in recent times. So it appears that some of them, the bulk of uh, being anti-citizens and being very brutal uh, and crude in their approach has beaten some of the officials. So, But those in the majority, as they usually claim, uh, should take measures to ensure that the bad guys don't damage further the, the names of these institutions. But I think uh, we must commend their sacrifices of these institutions in helping to ensure that uh, we have a, a decent and secure society. Now, in keeping with the goal to find a decent and secure society is also the need to plan. Now, The Guardian this morning has a human angle story of concern as it concerns the abuse and violation of urban town planning laws. Now, this is also greeted with the statistics owing to population projection occasioned by the migration of dwellers from rural communities to the urban cities. Mega cities in the likes of Lagos, Abuja, Potakot are projected to have an overarching population growth come the year 2030. Now, it's also been recorded that 604 buildings have collapsed under a period of review between 1974 and May 30th, 2024. Now, we've seen the likes of Lagos also go a step further by demolishing illegal structures, but the challenges of our population in urban centers and how can we engender respect for urban planning laws in the hearts of our citizens? Yes, how do we engender respect for the urban planning laws? That's uh, something very crucial. And incidentally, Bito, today is World Population Day. Exactly. And... Uh, is the dynamics between this and the population growth, the population dynamics uh, becomes very crucial. And the theme of this world population, they speaks to enumeration, that census, they need to count uh, everybody, leaving no one behind. And that brings it to planning. You plan with numbers. 
the, the last time we had census uh, was in 2006. That's almost 20 years, 18 years ago. And usually within 10 years, there should be another census. So what numbers are we planning? Perhaps it's 40 because what we're using is population estimates, which might not likely be very correct given that Nigeria of 2006 is so much different from the Nigeria of today. But having made that point, there are different uh, dimensions to this. There are people who are professionals in urban planning, a number of schools, uh, people study urban and regional planning. Every local government in the country should have these professionals, uh, have town planning authority. Uh, but what do we have? We have some states which in the entire system, all the local government, you will not find a single urban and regional planner in the employment of the local government. So who is responsible? For the planning you know so what we see is uh the have people if you put a block you some people will come and write stop work you know usually sometimes there, there are doubts that are used for that and you, you go and pay certain money and you go and continue work you can build over drainages you can build and there's also the aspect of corruption uh, in implementing especially in the cities where people collect money and give approvals and uh, people get to build some also give fake approvals it's, it's, it's just kind of uh, crazy but one aspect I think uh, needs to be taken care of instead of every time bulldozers moving demolition and all it appears like uh, we, we happy with destroying it's, it's, it's really painful you know, I, I usually don't watch those videos to the end when I see buildings being brought down and all. It doesn't get, it's, it's traumatic, you know. So, and if I feel that traumatic about it, I, you know, talk about those who own those properties, some of who are rendered homeless. It's something that is very difficult that we shouldn't even get there. So, if we have to destroy buildings uh, to create ways for water and all, it's a sign of failure. Why that is done, measures should be taken so that in 10 years' time, we don't have to be destroying buildings to enforce uh, these laws. Who approved that? Where is uh, accountability? People should be held accountable. If you have civil servants who made those approvals, you know, and uh, people get to build and it's found that it was wrong, even if they are in retirement, they should be prosecuted. People should be punished for doing that so that we minimize to the barriers, you know, to every level, this extent of violation of uh, plans. But in many places, there is no planning. The population is growing faster and you have people just build anyhow. Then they want to expand roads. They will go and start demolishing building to dualize roads and all of that. Let's plan ahead. Let's engage professionals. There are many people who are graduating and some of them now go into private estates this thing when they should be in government being responsible for planning and implementation so let's hire more professionals in every local government in every community you know to ensure proper planning because it helps the sdg 11 sustainable development goal 11 talks about sustainable cities you know and it has all of these these uh, different about 11 uh, 13 targets or thereabouts you know and the slums and everything how conducive accessible uh, that places that we live and as well transportation and other things is supposed to be. Now, we talk about, when we talk about the homeless and the slums, uh, one of the challenges that we faced, in fact, when we look at the Abuja territory for, you know, as it stands now, we see that one of the uh, very, very lucrative business is to go into real estate. Every day, every week, every month, you see real estate agencies churning out new buildings, new lands for sale, and so on. Yet we have many houses that are empty houses. No one is living there. We see governments calling for demolitions of slums uh, with the, uh, with the uh, story of these slums have been habited by hoodlums, you know, disturbing the peace of the people. How do we um, put this together? The challenges we're facing with homelessness, housing deficits, 
with so many houses and lands for sale, owned by people, empty. Yet, it's as though we're living in the midst of plenty, yet we have nothing. Uh, absolutely. Uh, many residents of FCT are actually suffering in the midst of plenty in, in different ways. Uh, whether it's housing, whether it's education, whether it's health. If you go outside the city center, you know, especially in places with high population uh, density and cluster, you see that, uh, you know, people shouldn't be living in those kind of conditions, especially those who are in the capital territory of Nigeria. How do we do this? Uh, the one key factor is population. Our population is growing faster than the economy. And, that, and that's a fact. So, and as long as we have our population growing faster than the economy, it's continued to reflect on uh, the paucity of facilities, uh, it reflects in different ways, not having sufficient housing, you know, overcrowding, not having enough jobs, not having enough uh, health facilities and education facilities for the people. You know, our population growth rate is estimated at around 2.6 uh, per annum. But when was the last time the Nigerian economy grew up to, you know, two, uh, more than 2%? the we some had two economic recessions which is negative growth you know in the space of uh, five years so family planning educating people to moderate do child spacing have as many kids as they can take care of is one of the might not have immediate effect but it's one of the uh, things that we must pay attention to to moderate our population growth then the local governments you know have a lot of roles because they are town planning authorities. So, for the case of Abuja Area Council, they should be for, um, providing decent housing and making it affordable is one of the primary responsibilities of of government, ensuring that we have this. The buildings who have no occupants, you know, they are private uh, estate uh, companies that get this uh, with the development authorities uh, within the FCT, you know, so they get that. There are also suspicions or allegations sometimes that there is also uh, money laundering cases involved. It's, you know, people lose resources and uh, connivance with some uh, private agencies, get those monies as, as estates. And when uh, the, they want to get the money back, they sell it, you know, those are uh, some allegations that do come up uh, and some persons make cases oh, we begin to tax you know people should pay taxes for those houses so that it will make them to get people into it but these uh the government uh, i believe knows why that happens but as citizens we need uh, amenities to get to every part if for instance wherever you are in the fct you have access to good roads you have access to pipe bone water. There is pipe bone water flowing to 47 FCT, but it doesn't go beyond the Gariki district, Wuse district, Asokoro, and Metama district. If you go to uh, Warempa, Kubwa, you know, it's not, and these places are also like part of the developed parts. People in Wagulada, they don't they don't have access to it. People in, in Kuje, and even Lokogoma, you know, within uh, Amak, uh, Municipal Area Council. You go there, you have estate. Inside the estate, there are roads. But to get to the estate, you don't have uh, decent roads. You know, and you, uh, every comp every house have its own borehole and all of that. So these are issues to look at. Uh, take these facilities, uh, the, uh, amenities everywhere so that people, the population will spread and they, that this clustering and also transportation is also key. There is decent transportation that you can live in Abaji and you get to Amak within, uh, with a decent, comfortable transportation within an hour. You know, everybody will not be clustering around Maharaba, Nya Nya, and, you know, because they want to be closer to the city. People will comfortably live in Abaji, in Kuali and uh, all these areas and come to work and go back decently. So these are things that I, I think should be 
uh, prioritize to decongest some of these uh, slummy areas, you know, like Durumi inside the uh, near Gariki and all of that. Uh, you go to Jabi, you also see another slum. They're just uh, clustered all over the place. It's, uh, people should leave this 